We're now going to be taking a trip into the imaginary world with a master of puppetry. It's our enormous pleasure to welcome Mervyn Miller to the stage. Please give him a round of applause. Um, yeah, I'm a puppeteer, so uh, I'm the only person today who's not going to talk about digital media. Sorry about that. Um, um, okay, let's start with a do a puppet. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I'm doing there, but also quite a lot about what you're doing. Um, uh, and because um, the theme of today is about engagement and, and the audience, uh, we want to talk a little bit about what people do when they're watching, uh, as well as what people do when they're doing. Um, what I do for a living is train people to move objects in front of other people in such a way that the audience might believe that they're alive. Um, Just got some slides to give you an idea of the sort of thing that we do. And um, sometimes we work with kind of beautiful made objects um, like these or like this um, that have been made by specialists uh, with kind of months of design and development behind them. Oh, there we go. Um, sometimes they've got very complex joints. They're sculpted through kind of long research processes or they might be very large. <laughs> like this one. Um, but the more you work uh, with the performers and uh, with the audiences, the, m the more you start to find that uh, very simple objects and materials can sometimes make the effect even stronger. Um, so you might use just a piece of cloth like that. and create character very quickly. Or you might just use a piece of paper, a piece of paper like this. Um, and very quickly, you start to see a character emerge just from the rhythm of the breath and the movement. And the key thing that I want to get at here is that the audience uh, people uh, like to imagine. They, they like to imagine people, they like to imagine stories, they like to imagine cause and effect. When they see two events, they automatically start to link them together. Uh, they respond um, very quickly to things uh, that aren't in the conscious part of the brain. Um, and if you let them, they'll imagine quite a lot. Um, sometimes creative people get very hung up about the value of their own imagination, and, um, and uh, rightly so in some cases. Um, but the art exists in the space between the artist and the audience. Um, it needs both parts of that equation to, to make it happen, and both sides are bringing imagination to that event. Um, and that's sort of obvious if you work in theatre, where um, we all turn up and sit in a room and pretend that we're looking at a drawing room in the 19th century or um, the, the, a castle in Denmark, even when we all know that that's clearly not the case. Um, but perhaps it's even more um, relevant in fields like music or visual arts where uh, the suggestions and the material is more suggestive uh, and relational and um, the experience of watching it is more subjective. Um, can I get some volunteers? I need three people to come and help me uh, to show this process in action. Anyone feeling like learning some puppetry today? Go on. Surprise me. Thank you very much. That's one. <laughs> yes, please, thank you. What's your name? Ina. Ina, brilliant. Ina. Yes. Nice to meet you. That's two. Hi. Kroot. Kroot. Oh, Hello. Uh, great, one more. 
Oh, good for you. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, uh, so here's another piece of paper. Um, this is... I suppose there's a mic on it. Here's another piece of paper. This is um, uh, clearly it's two bits of paper bent into the shape of a man. Um, and uh, I was taught how to make this by a guy called Adrian Kohler at Handspring Puppet Company. Um, Inna, do you, would you take the head? Sure. Um, this is one of the, give Wes a chance to turn on the mic. <laughs> I'll just use one of these so I can move around a bit more. So Inna's just going to hold the head and um, she's naturally taken that in her right hand. So if you take the um, left arm uh, or whichever arm is free with your other hand. Okay. There you go. And uh, Louise, would you come and uh, if you take the, the waist of the puppet and the other arm. That's great. And Cruz, I'm going to give you the uh, glamour job of if you stand in between them <laughs> and just take hold of those, those feet. That's terrific. Um, so we're just going to learn a really simple um, way of operating this, this figure. Um, Cruz, your job is uh, critical. You're going to keep the, the feet in contact with the ground. <laughs> <laughs> So you just clamp down, and um, you, you don't pick those up unless uh, you really want to. Um, and Louise, if you could pull up slightly against the feet, so we start to get a little bit of muscle in the legs. That's great. And uh, that waist is going to stay nice and solid, uh, and you're the centre of gravity there, the centre of the, the kind of weight there. And, you know, you're going to... Um, you're in charge of the head and the top half of the body, so you can breathe, you can look... Uh, and things like this. Now, most of the time, people stand with their arms down by their sides. Um, uh, the puppet normally seems to start with its arms out like this. Um, so <laughs> drop those arms down to a nice, comfortable position. Um, and first of all, I'm just going to ask you to breathe. Great. So let's keep that waist really still and the feet really still. So we start to isolate that breathing movement just in the chest. That's lovely. A nice big deep breath in and relax those arms on the out breath. That's great. Now can you look over at the door there? Some people coming in late. Say hello. <laughs> <laughs> you see the importance of cooperation in puppetry there. Uh, <laughs> the classic two-handed wave. Um, and um, just take a little breath again. I find your balance. And looking over at the exciting desk. I don't know what they're doing over there. Twittering, probably. <laughs> Very good. Um, great. So it's, it's pretty quick to find this intelligence. And, and right at the heart of it is, is breath. Um, uh, once the puppeteers are breathing uh, the thoughts of a character, then it's really easy for you to find your way naturally into that, into that rhythm. So um, let's try something a little bit more challenging. Um, OK, puppet. Um, very good. <laughs> um, could I ask you to lift up one foot off the ground and then uh, stay with one foot on the ground for, off the ground for a bit and then put it back down again? <laughs> How was that? It was all right, right? <laughs> um, so, so that's very good. Um, so we're going to do that again. Um, and this time... Um, uh, the difference is going to be the inner is going to decide when it happens and you're not going to tell anyone it's just going to be the right time and Louise and Cruz are going to just you're just going to know just listen to each other take it easy take your time it doesn't happen to have to happen quickly but let me say this when you put, lift one leg off the ground the whole of your body is involved in not, you not falling over okay. um, uh, so there's tension throughout the body in that so take a little moment just find your breath Fantastic. That was really nice, wasn't it? Oh, my goodness. That's great. They're so good. I'm going to do, ask them to do something else because I, I enjoyed it so much. So, <laughs> um, uh, so you could see Inna's got... There's all sorts of little uh, micro-communications between those, those people, and it's quite nice to watch. Um, uh, so let's just say that you're interested in, um, in this apple. So I'm going to describe a scenario, and you're going to keep uh, doing amazing acting. So take your time. Let's say you haven't seen the apple yet. Okay. <laughs> so, I know, this is like rehearsing. You've got to wipe your mind. Um, so the puppet's relaxed. 
And he's standing, let's say, I don't know if it's a he or a she, in a decides whether it's a he or a she. It's a she, obviously. obviously. <laughs> <laughs> She's standing, it's outside. It's a little bit cold. She's been there some time. <laughs> <laughs> and keep that thought going, but don't worry about showing us anything. So you feel it in the breath of the puppet, but you don't need to give us mime. And Inna, can you just let the other two hear your breath so that you're breathing just slightly out loud, your mouth slightly open. And then Louise and Cruz, you're just going to breathe with her. So the puppet's breath is just in the chest, but all three puppeteers are completely in rhythm with each other, which means that when Inna does an in-breath to prepare for something or to see something, the other two of you know exactly when that happens without signals or anything like that. So the puppet sees the apple, there it is, beautiful. And just think what you want to think. Yeah, great. And come a little bit heavier on those footsteps, Cruz. <laughs> She's paper light. <laughs> Keep your focus on the apple there, you know, lovely. Oh, little look around, make sure no one's watching. <laughs> Just keep playing that thought that you don't, um, you don't want anyone to catch you stealing the apple. <laughs> Impeccable technique. Um, that's great. Look, that's three pages of my tiny notes. Um, so we know what they're doing. They're doing acting. They're communicating between each other. There's a kind of l l load of layers of little signals going between each other. And uh, as very often nowadays we work with visible puppeteers, which means that that's one of the levels of enjoyment that the audience uh, are having. Um, but what... I'm really interested in talking about is, is what you're doing. Because you're just looking at three people holding a bit of paper on a table. Um, and when um, the little apple boy or the paper man walks over to the edge of the table and, and sees a precipice, uh, all of you imagine your own little cliff face. Um, uh, all of you see that street differently that uh, she was in uh, when she's making the apple. And uh, on stage or when we're making our art, we're absolutely assembling a set of cues together uh, to prompt people's imagination, but we're not really in control of it. Um, and it's the moments uh, when the puppet stops um, that the audience um, get involved. I, I, I watched the panel discussions this morning, and um, uh, particularly in the first one, there was uh, quite a lot of talk. There's a lot of um, uh, very skilled uh, marketing professionals working <laughs> and talking today. Um, and, uh, and you can hear their urgency in, um, in, in the desperation to get the message across before the audience changed channels. <laughs> um, and it, and it, was quite, it was quite alarming in a way to me because the one thing that I, that I know <laughs> from, having, from doing all this is that um, you need to give the audience time to find their way into your, little ima into, into your imaginary vista. You need to give them space and time to do their imagining um, so that they can start to invest in what you're doing. And it's in those moments uh, the movement might draw your attention to the character, but it's when the character stops and thinks about what it's going to do next that's when your brain rushes up on stage and puts yourself in their position. So it's the stops, not the, not the movements that really uh, resonate. Um, imagination is easy. Um, uh, what we do makes is there to make the imagination easier. It's there to allow the audience who've turned up uh, or who are watching your material um, uh, do their imagining in, in such a way that you're, you're guiding them and helping them. Um, but it's a mutual act, and it's really important for us to remember that in the moment, in the moment of creation of the art, rather than the creation of the material, it's the audience who are doing the heavy lifting uh, based on your work. Um, so that's it. Uh, well, that went much quicker than I expected, which is great. Which means 
you can ask me questions. <laughs> but that's, uh, that's the gist of my, uh, my point. So thank you very much for listening. Has anyone got any questions? Oh, look, the lights go up. Really? Oh, it's disappointing. <laughs> we say thank you again to the volunteers. Oh, hello. Is oh, this look, on? Someone comes with a microphone. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier just amongst ourselves about kind of puppetry having a bit of a moment, it seems, in terms of um, adult audiences. And I guess that kind of starts with War Horse, but also kind of upcoming um, Charlie Kaufman movie coming out and various other yeah. bits and pieces. And I'm just wondering what it is you think about puppetry in particular that can appeal to an adult audience or seems to be appealing at the moment. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I've never really worked much for children's audiences, and, uh, and so um, uh, uh, it's a good job I wasn't born 20 years earlier. <laughs> it might have been harder. Um, but, yeah, I worked a lot on... We worked a lot on War Horse, and uh, I was going to show all these uh, pictures again, but um, we worked a lot on War Horse, and um, the, um, the puppeteers have been making complex work for adult audiences for a long time. They've just been doing it in smaller rooms. Um, and um, something exciting happened with, uh, with Tom Morris at the National um, when he started that process going and, and to make that show. And he'd seen Handspring, who designed that, those horses. Uh, he'd seen their work and he'd programmed their work and uh, made friends with them. Um, and he knew in a way that a bigger audience could access it, but it still very, felt very risky. Um, when we went up on the opening night, we kind of were expecting some sledging reviews about, yeah, it was all right for 20 minutes, but then after that, you know, I don't want to look at the man holding the stick. Um, <coughs> so none of us were completely confident about, about those things happening, but um, it does take shows like that, it does take shows like, shows like Wars and Lion King and, and Avenue Q to, to do that. And um, Avenue Q and Lion King take children's material in a way or, twi or, or, or manipulate children's material to make it, bring it to an adult audience. Um, but we are seeing um, um, work that's definitely focused on adults. And I think the Charlie Kaufman movie is going to be really interesting in terms of how people review it. Um, uh, I've already heard some muttering on, on, the, on the media about um, uh, reading reviews of the film that don't mention the fact that there are any puppets in it. <laughs> talk about the actor's voice, they review the actor's voices and they review the script, but there's absolutely no critical commentary on what you're looking at on screen for the whole part of the movie. So um, that's interesting. We talked a little bit, uh, or we heard a little bit earlier about, uh, again, about liveness um, and the, um, the value of liveness being uh, kind of more uh, exciting in a, in a, in a digital world. Um, and I think puppetry plays to that um, you know, there was a, an unfortunate um, period in theatre where, where it felt like it was in competition with film um, in terms of trying to be realistic. But, um, and, and part of what is exciting about puppetry is that, is that you can see the mechanics. You can see the people doing it. You know it's artificial. You know it's happening now. You know it's in front of you. Um, and this act of mutual imagination is, is, is absolutely fundamental. So I think as adults with sophisticated uh, artistic... Uh, understandings and you know people who are growing up in this younger generation um, are so articulate in terms of uh, the tropes of, of, of film and of theatre and of storytelling and of the mechanics of all of that um, uh, it's, it's ludicrous to suggest that they can't deal with watching the story and the way the story is made at the same time, they're absolutely used to that um, <coughs> so puppetry and other forms of kind of theatre that um, Exposed mechanics uh, are playing with that, and um, and I think that appeals to to that that crowd too. That's a long answer, wasn't it? <laughs> it's longer than my talk. <laughs> um, any more? <laughs> Great, you're going to get back on schedule, okay? <laughs> No? Brilliant. Guy, you've got something to say. Yeah, I thought I had to, really. Um, <laughs> what's the biggest challenge for you as a puppeteer at the moment? Um, is, is it mechanical? Is it trying to invent something new? Is it um, keeping people's um, 
just focus on what you're doing. It yeah, I mean, um, the pleasure of the, the creative pleasure of the job is problem solving and art and sculpture and design and um, mechanical things and, and breaking new ground and all those things. Um, those are the selfish uh, ambitions, <laughs> I think, of any artist. But you, your challenges are storytelling challenges. Your challenges are getting across to the audience and making sure that um, your personal ambitions aren't getting in the way of, your, uh, of what you're really there for. Um, it's, working in theatre is a very collaborative medium anyway. So um, we're working with other people. You're, all, you're always walking into a room with a bunch of other people and talking about what's the most important thing that's happening. How do we get people to, under, to, to, to relate to these characters, to get involved in this story? Um, so um, the, the vehicles through which you, you might choose to articulate that, that engagement, um, uh, it's great to be resourceful and, and excited about those things. And the more experience we have, the more you want to work with video or you want to work with... Um, uh, with different types of puppets or different scales of puppets and um, but really the challenge is always um, have we missed something out in the story <laughs> is this coming across can they can they feel what it feels like to be that woman or that man in this scene that we're trying to convey um, are we going too fast are we going too slow when does the music come in when do we fade the lights those kinds of things so yeah I mean it's it's always about the um, uh, it's always about the audience. It's always about the connection. Uh, and, and can you always tell how the audience is going to react? Never. <laughs> never. No, there's, um, there's a sort of um, luxury tradition of uh, previews in, um, in some, uh, in, in some theatres. And um, occasionally you have to work somewhere where there's no previews. In, in, in uh, Europe, they, they don't do previews. And you, and you, just, you just do the show <laughs> on the opening night and then you find out what anyone thought and you're not allowed to keep working on the show it's really weird um but here thankfully we we usually get to do a few shows with an audience where you can hear what they're what they're doing and you can start to feel the the the, the performance breathe in the room it's c crucial for the performers um as well in terms of in terms of finding their rhythm um but um yeah audiences um are always um full of surprises <laughs> um but uh, you know they they stay ahead of you, and that and that's the way it should be. That, that keeps us looking for um, for new challenges. I think that really is the end of the time. <laughs> so thank you very much for listening, um, and um, good luck with the rest of the day.